and we're starting and the recording's working and good morning there is no sound box we apologize for that but we are here now okay 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 all right good stuff all right so um let's talk about friday's price action um friday the market uh we we had a little news about uh as i tweeted out from china interesting thing i was doing some trades over in prague and i kept getting this um Disconnected from server. Disconnected from server um, was kind of interesting because it was uh, pretty hard to trade actually, and showing them how to uh, put on um, some day trades, which worked out, but uh, as you could probably imagine, a little frustrating. And um, <clears throat> so the fact is, Omnovia is a excru excruciatingly, as you've probably noticed yourself, it's it's a very tough. Um, uh, it's it's a memory hog, so it kind of really does not help. But one of the things that I did is I forwarded it off to Jeff uh, uh, an email, uh, and um, I wasn't even getting his replies back, so it was kind of like a, a really weird internet thing um, that was occurring, and I'm not sure if it was because of my ESET and security and all that other good stuff. But one thing that I noticed, just to get straight to the point, is that in the Russell, as the Russell we did form a daily low closed doji, and as we gapped lower, um, and we were trading in the in the Russell. Um, one of the things that I uh, picked up was that we started to trade significantly below in the Russell, significantly below the advanced decline lines and the moving average. So from a point move, or you can even look at that from a percentage type move, from the point of moving average to the low, we dropped about two almost two and three quarters percent change wise below the moving average now um, something I generally don't go over a, a whole lot but this is kind of advanced but it, um, looking at the percent change of the advanced decline is something that I, I kind of take a look at it's not just looking at as you know I always uh, have talked about percent change that's why when we look at relative strength we look at relative strength as I share with you in terms of percent because not everything is priced the same so the amount of stocks within the advanced decline of the Russell is a lot different than the advanced decline of the stocks that are contained in, in the Dow Jones Industrial Average so we want to do it in terms of percent rather than absolute numbers so with that said the advanced decline and the volume and, and by all uh, traditional manners when you get an, a, a low closed doji and on an intraday basis when you start to see the negative breath and we start to break down like we did the fact that we come back over and look at Thursday we started to see a, a decline in the advanced uh, AD line and we really didn't move anywhere here so um, the funny thing is is the Russell the small cap may see um, a little if not under pressure the small cap might see some rotation out of the market if we take a look at the NYSE which again the NYSE also made low closed dojis now um, typically daily low closed dojis scare the you know if you're long they're not good if you're short they're awesome but needless to say in this type of environment if you take a notice of where and how much percentage change from the moving average to the advanced decline it was like a quarter percent off the NYSE so it barely moved and the volume came right into the moving average so the NYSE the low closed doji um, you know it wasn't a, a it, while it is a low closed doji it indicates a stall maybe rather than a an actual sell-off is ensuing in the diamonds in the Dow Jones industrial average when we take a look at the daily chart and as you can see, there was, I mean, narrowly a budge of the AD line relative to the moving average. So it looks a lot worse than it really is. And we take a look at the S&Ps, the same thing. Um, the S&Ps did see a sell-off um, of more magnitude compared to the Dow, but less of a sell-off compared to the Russell. So um, what's the point I'm going to make? Well, I would say that the Russell is obviously the weakest link in the chain and it doesn't mean that if we do get a sell-off I think it's more of a sector rotational change rather than the actual top in the market if you look at the seasonal trend of the market here the seasonal tendency is on or about the week ending May 24th that we see a market that moves lower and then you know that kind of marks the seasonal high for the year until we get back into late uh, September October that doesn't mean that the Russell's going to crap out and go straight down to hell in a handbasket. It just means that 
we want to be a little bit defensive and, and, and pay more attention. We actually took a small position or a position in TZA as a protective hedge, which may or may not work, but I thought it was kind of a smart move to go with TZA. TZA is the inverse ETF in um, the Russell, because if the Russell weakens or doesn't go down, it's a good hedge. If you're going to get short, get short the weakest stock index that's on the planet. Um, so with that said, that was that was the reason if you are a PA Stock Alert subscriber, that's why we came up with that. Now, in, in proof positive, we've been talking about a bunch of stocks, and I did lose my voice, and yes, I probably sound like um, death warmed over, but please excuse that. Um, one of the things that I wanted, um, a few things that I wanted to cover today um, was some stock um, ideas. Number one, we, we were um, positive and bullish and have a position in on uh, Morgan Stanley. I was long and had positions in Seagate, which STX, as you guys know, um, I, if you get my tweets, then you know I, I got flat. I tried to only scale out a half, but then as I was watching the market melt down and while I was getting a little bit of frustrated with the lack of the internet and the connectivity in the market, I decided to just flatten an entire position in Seagate. I'm kind of, um, you know, as a human being, I'm, you know, this is being recorded and I don't like to admit things like this, but, you know, I do get uh, succumb to emotions like uh, anger every once in a while, frustration, and so with that said, <laughs> just being honest with you guys, I, uh, I, I, I flattened out on Seagate, STX. It's up 50 cents today, and STX, I'll probably, to be honest with you, um, I like Seagate in, in, the, um, um, in, in the technical um, patterns, uh, both the daily and the weekly, and so I will look for a pullback where I'll just move on to the next trade. Now, Morgan Stanley, we've got 14 minutes, and I'm going to go a little dark. I'm working, uh, I'm going to probably look to, because I am in options. Options have what's called theta time decay. I'm in directional, I'm in calls, and I'm going to work orders, and I have to chase the market, because I've got orders working to liquidate my calls a lot higher, and if it happens, great, and if it doesn't, I cancel, replace, and I work orders and I'm going to do and liquidate half the position in Morgan Stanley. There might be a little bit more left in Morgan Stanley over time, and time means by like um, Wednesday, we should see if we do see today's Monday, so you got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you might see some positive follow through. How high do I think uh, Morgan can get to? Uh, possibly we could see Morgan back up to like 39, at least test uh, the highs that we made last year um, near that 39. When we take a look at, um, and I'll share with you in just a second, I'm trying to get this other page going. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. All right, so it is April. There wasn't a whole lot of um, seasonal trades uh, in the month of April to really look at. These were past trades. We had that like uh, the Aussie dollar versus the Swiss, the cattle hogs, the beans, um, bean meal. Um, but in any event, let's take a look at a couple things here. Seagate. This is one that um, when I say I like the technical picture on Seagate, um, I like the I like this fact that the market has had a breakout of an old high. It's had a breakout of a longer term trend, depending on where you want to draw your trend line from. Either way, it definitely had a breakout of that uh, resistance. And I think as we get near, and that's one of the main reasons why I was selling this thing is because we started to back off the highs. We were near that 59. But longer term, I really do like Seagate. It's in a a weekly buy, um, and I like the uptick in the OBV. So I'll be looking for a pullback uh, probably this week if we get into the maybe 56, a buck lower or so. I'll, I'll look at Seagate. Let me take a look at Morgan Stanley with you. As you know, we definitely, and hopefully everyone has a little position in MS. We got a clue off of MS based off the earnings that we saw in the other banks a week ago. Morgan Stanley had a really good volume on a weekly basis. That was a very strong clue um, about the, um, the strength 
that it was going into earnings with a strong performance. I mean, when I tell you it should probably get up to testing this 39 level high, it's because the volume levels, we just tested last week the volume levels um, when we were back trading at that level. So if I can compare an apple to an apple. So the last time the volume levels were at this high reading, um, prices were up there. Now in, in pre-hour session, you know, it could work either way. You know, it depends on what the world feels, whether um, they want to sell it on the opening and it's going to have a muted uh, uh, less than, uh, it'll, what I'm trying to explain is that sometimes pre-hour session makes a higher move than in the open outcry when people come into trading on the open outcry session versus the pre-hour session that, you know, few are approved to, you have to get a special approval and blah, blah, blah to trade in the pre-hour session. It's not that difficult, but it can be done. You just need money and, and a phone call and communication with your broker and you can get set up. Next, Morgan Stanley's trading at 37.51. So we're up near where the high, as you see here, is 37.56. So we're already trading near this high on, from Thursday uh, based on strong earnings. So the news is kind of out. So if we can, I think over the next couple days, we should try to get up to testing that high based on the on-balance volume. And that's why I suggest that, all right? Can we get up to the monthly pivot of 41? The market could do anything it wants. Um, I'm going to today because I'm in options. I like to take the immediate thrust of a move when I'm long an option because that's the heightened demand. It creates you know, uh, people who are short premium. They got to get out immediately. They get scared and you can offer a price and generally get picked off or taken out because for every buyer, there's got to be a seller. And if I'm looking to sell, someone's got to buy. And who the only person that's got to buy on a day like today on our earnings event is someone who's short the market or feels that the market's going to go a lot higher, and they'll be in that particular strike or that particular option. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to go over that. Juniper Networks, JNPR, Juniper Networks is another one. Um, double doji star, low close doji, light volume. But again, Juniper being in a seasonally strong pattern um, and in a sector that's seasonally strong, Juniper's up uh, 50 cents, 2% uh, today. So there's a lot of stuff that's recovering very sharply. The one thorn in my side happens to be IBM, and I still say that this market uh, will fill that gap. It's just a matter of, is, am I going to be right, and will it do it by the um, May option expiration? Um, the sell-off the other day, another pattern, low-close doji. If you look at Juniper Networks real quick, and if I zoomed up IBM, you'll notice that a lot of stocks, and I've been sharing this with you for a little while, that a lot of stocks seem to have very similar patterns. Notice that we had a doji on the 13th of April, a doji on the 15th of April, and then on Thursday, a very doji-ish-like pattern where the market opened at 163.31, closed at 163.13, very close to the open-close relationship. Let's go JNPR, look at Juniper real quick. We had a doji, double doji star. So on the 10th, these two days, the 13th was when IBM formed its doji. So right around the same time in the same uh, space, they all formed kind of like those dojis, which is kind of, you know, when, when I start to see the same uh, space or stocks that are in the same space form the same pattern, it, kind of tells me that if one goes up, then the others might go up with it. If one goes down, the others might go down if they're all interconnected and all trading very similar, especially if they have similar past price pattern behavior. It tells me that they will continue to have forward price pattern behavior so that we can trade off of, of you know, one market and take advantage of it by using a different uh, market. So in other words, Looking at, at Juniper, if it pops, IBM, it might pop. And IBM is up a buck sixty-two, but still doesn't really, you know, give us anything. Last but not least, another one is HPQ Hewlett Packard, which Hewlett Packard on a daily basis had a nice little buy signal, a high close doji to be uh, more specific. And the volume, I mean, for the for the little move that HPQ HP Hewlett Packard had, it had some pretty significant volume behind it. On a weekly basis, you know, it didn't. It just started to cross over 
the uh, moving average. And one of the, the things that I really liked about Hewlett Packard, and, and this might be a lo little bit longer term um, than uh, I would like, but in other words, the reaction of the rally, when it does happen, it should be a pretty strong move because of the fact we had a significant volume convergence. So the fact is also that this stock has a very strong seasonality, not into April, not into May, but going into June. So Hewlett Packard might see it could be like that delayed time bomb. Um, we talked and mentioned to you guys about a, a few names like Triple D had a high closed OG on a weekly basis. On a daily chart, it was looking good. Um, then we had the uh, um, competitor strategist, whatever the name is. Um, and you know, while it seemed to have had a better move than Triple D, it didn't have as great of a move in the volume. It kind of stagnated, and it, and it had that more of a sell-off due to the fact that the rally was on, as it was starting to rally, it, it, the volume started to fade. So when volume fades on a rally, when sell-offs come, they can be a little bit uh, deeper. So when we look at Hewlett Packard, for example, um, well, that's a pretty strong volume. It looks a hell of a lot different than uh, Stratus. It looks Stratus, S-Y-S-S. Uh, one of these days, I'll get it in my mind what the heck the name of this, uh, pronounce the, the stock correctly. Um, but you get, uh, hopefully, you get my message. My point is that a stock that has very strong volume, when it sells off, the sell-off should be muted. And then if it resurges to the upside, we should have a stronger move. So that's what I'm looking at Hewlett Packard, okay? Um, so in running scans, as you can probably imagine, um, based on the fury of the sell-off that we saw on um, the sell-off that we saw on Friday, there wasn't a whole lot of weekly or daily uh, or daily high closed dojis. But I will tell you on weekly, here's one that's a very strong surprise that we may want to take focus in on, and it's kind of like in that space, okay? which by the way, I'm sure you guys know we dumped on the Merck. Here is uh, the one trade. If I, I do not have the weekly market thoughts, um, but needless to say, when you take a look at this product, and this might freak everybody out, but it is Yelp, and it was on our list at the beginning of the year, um, which it didn't quite have a great move from the beginning of the year quite yet. Um, stocks that tend to get sold off going into uh, the beginning of the year, they get uh, tend to rally from approximately the uh, beginning of January into the May time period. Selling may go away, but here on a daily chart, which is what a lot of people kind of focus in on, they look at um, you know more stock traders tend to just focus in on daily chart patterns. And while the you know the volume, the sideways action, and the volume doesn't look great, look at the weekly chart. The weekly looks a lot better. Now we've done, obviously, we've done some analysis on Yelp and we've um, had this where we've, we've been probably telling people to, or you guys, to be looking at support coming into this area here, which is, it, and then all we are looking for is a buy signal. So if you can imagine this, since January 16th, we've not generated a single buy signal until when? Right last week. And then finally, we got not just a weekly buy signal, but look at the volume here. So again, this might be a surprise for a few people because they're all looking at the daily chart. Very relatively few people look at weekly charts. And if you take a look at this and you see the high is 48.24, you'll notice the close is 48.30. 30 is greater than 24. So we have a weekly high close doji and we have a weekly uptick in with the OBV. So with that said, this to me, could be the chart, and not just the chart, but the trade of the week. Now, I don't have the weekly thoughts out. Um, you know, I guess it's an assumption that uh, the weekly thoughts, to be honest with you, um, you know, I enjoy doing it to set myself up. Uh, I started it. It's not something we charge for. It wasn't a part of the package deal. It's just, uh, you know, something added. But I like doing my homework, and I like to trade off of it. And I promised that sometime this afternoon I will get it out. But the neat thing is coming in on Monday's planning and scanning is, is we can take a look at um, what might be on that sheet. How's that sound, everybody? And right now, Yelp would be one.
that I think is a strong contender um, in in the sense that we have a, um, a, a a nice trade set up for the trade of the week. Now, um, an, an other stocks that generated weekly high closed OGs, and if you think about it, in all in all fairness, um, there were five names that generated weekly high closed dojis and I'm going to go through the weekly charts with you right now. I think that has to say something. Bear with me a second, folks. Awesome. I don't have to say anything. I've already done my work. All right, so um, let's come up with wrapping up. We had AU, Anglo Gold. This is something that, uh, you know, in a market that is in a seasonally kind of a weak period of time, as you can see, the worst time of the year to start buying gold is, you know, in late May. So maybe you can get a short-term trade out of uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti, but... Uh, uh, you know, this is one that I'm not, I don't know, I just don't like the seasonal pattern, but it is a high-closed OG, and I need to disclose that for you. Another one that we had for you is Men's Warehouse, MW. Um, it's not a high-closed OG because of the fact it's after a down, it's after an uptrend, not a, not a downtrend, but it did run up on the scans. The next one is XOM, interesting, Exxon Mobil did generate a weekly high close doji, has some strong seasonals at least going into, um, you know, uh, 1st of May into July. Earnings though, by the way, this is the risk, is on the 30th, all right? So in, in, in another week or so, we have earnings, but that might be for a nice play, if not on uh, Exxon on a weekly basis. The daily charts, I like this pattern where the market moves up, it has a two-day pullback, and it almost has that kind of like, um, you know, wedge-ish type, um, you know, if you want to consider this potentially a cup rally and then a small little, I wouldn't call this a coffee cup and handle, I would call it more like a little dainty teacup and handle, uh, but needless to say, it it does have that that flavor of uh, a rally. It would have been nicer to catch the high-closed doji, but, it, you know, we, we had caught a lot of nice trade setups in this room. Um, and it's tough to catch all of them, but needless to say, strong seasonals. The only thing missing on the daily chart um, is is the the volume, and um, but on the weekly chart, that volume looks a little bit better. So it does look aggressive. So Exxon, this might be a better consideration for some if the um, implied volatility, and I'm going to check that with you right this second. So for options trader. Um, the implied volatility, 19%. Um, relative to the last 52 weeks, it's Exxon. Pays a dividend, 34 versus 13 high, low, implied weekly, implied volatility. Um, and from the seasonalities, the good thing is knowing that from about, you know, going in from April into June, um, we would probably look at, Perhaps maybe the uh, you know for selling some theta the May options expire in 25 days. Um, I'd have to look at a little bit more detail, but it seems the 87 and a half have an open interest of 11,000. Exxon is not in that May. Um, looking at at the May options or looking at any options, it's not a really heavily traded optionable product, believe it or not. I mean, the volume, the open interest, volume's not existent so far this morning. The market's been open for three minutes. Um, but needless to say, they're, they're really, it would be a great theoretic trade to sell put premium in, in, that, in that market. Um, I mean, how much upside can I expect out of, the, uh, out of this trade? Um, when we take a look at monthly and quarterly pivots, you know, Within by June, I would say 91. So the key is, if the market goes from here to 91, I've got a, a 4% move. I think somehow between now and June, somewhere together, you and I, we can find another stock, another product that'll give us a 4% move somewhere. 
So I'm going to take a pass on this one. Again, my I, I filter out trades between what my risk is and what my potential rewards are, and I think that we will see something um, a little bit better. When I look at Yelp, I say, you know, Yelp might have, you know, from a perspective of, of a trade, um, if we get up to quarterly pivot resistance, that's 15 percent. 15 percent. Oh, I mean, the, if the market couldn't go down in this whole time and we have a weekly high closed doji, uh, I'd be more interested in looking at Yelp. And then with this uh, market, how would I trade Yelp? I'd be looking at Yelp from if we are going to see a rally, either look for how this market stabilizes. You know that for the next two weeks, since this is a weekly high closed doji, if the market is going to move, right, then you know that by the end of this week, or and at the very least, next week, you better see positive performance. So if you do not see positive performance, not only do you have your initial, if you're going to buy the stock, your, your uh, uh, stop loss goes underneath this level where these lows are, right? That would be your level of stop on an individual stock. Your stop loss is approximately a little hefty, which is approximately about 7%. I can't get this um, thing to, to share with us um, to get it exact, but your stop loss needs to be under 44.74 which is approximately, if I can get it measured exactly, there we go, almost 8%. So you're risking, and that's about a two-to-one risk-reward ratio. Um, you know, even if you only meet a one-to-one risk-reward ratio, you're asking the market if it does pull back, if you can get maybe a fill somewhere around 47.80 to four, right here, 48.20 on, on Yelp, um, your, your, your holding period would be for positive results the next two weeks, because this is a weekly chart. So again, with a high closed doji, we want to see immediate results within two time periods. If this is a weekly chart, two time periods means two weeks. If you don't see anything within two weeks, and you're, you know, if you're in a stock, theta is not a big deal. If you're in an option, two weeks is kind of a big deal. So when we take a look at Yelp, and we have so many stocks to choose from, um, this week because of earnings um, and some some special earnings plays you know Yelp is one as you can see here we have earnings coming out well that's in another week from now next week so you have some time before this market to see if you want to get some uh, progress in it but um, when I see this trade if you're going to do an option trade to consider earnings next week if you're going to trade the stock itself, here's one of the other techniques that we can look at. Since we have a daily low close doji, we have a weekly high close doji, the weekly volume looks good. Um, this is one that you can also trade from a breakout standpoint, and a breakout um, concept would be on a close back above Friday's high, which is also above that pivot. So if the market is going to go up, and if you want to buy the snapback to move weekly moving averages, and if you want to buy the snapback into trend, you know you, what your risk is. If you don't want to buy the falling knife, so to speak, and you want to look for positive momentum as the market maybe starts to prove itself, right, and you want to buy higher, you might pay more, but you'll increase the probability that you are on the right side and you buy the breakout above, which now Friday becomes a last conditional change because it closed below that prior bar's low. It just also happened to be a low closed doji. So two ways that you can play this is wait for the market to get a close back above Friday's high and then go with a directional trade. And that would be my preference if we were going to be trading um, uh, if we were going to be trading options on this one, I would prefer to go with the breakout because it's immediate. It shows there's positive momentum and the move is happening now rather than later. So that's, that's some of the thing, a, a couple ways that I would be looking at. Again, keep in mind, the number is a close above 4901 gets you into a positive move of Yelp and you're looking for, at the very least, a move back up to 55. All right, I want to go through a couple other things which we haven't done in a while, which I'm going to go from A to Z on three names, which we, we kind of do on a daily basis, actually. I take that back. 
um, A to Z. Let's take a look at the ES from day, A to Z day trading technique. So I'm going to go through real quickly uh, on, on the market conditions, number one, and points of interest to look at, number two. The charts in front of you shows A, number one, a weekly chart on the bottom right. This is a weekly chart. It has OBV, seasonals, and the commitment of traders. Next, you have a daily chart. Then next, you have a 60-minute, you have a 15-minute, you have a 5-minute, and then a 3-minute. So for day trading purposes, for today, note that we did get a low closed OG sell signal. We snap back to moving average on a daily basis. We are in a mixed market condition because we're still in a weekly buy mode. We're in a weekly buy mode, and last week the market pulled to weekly moving average. So we are stuck between weekly moving average and daily moving average. So if I'm going to look to be a buyer, I want to buy this market on further strength. If I'm going to sell this market, I want to sell on weakness. And so for me, what would be weakness? Person's pivots on a 60-minute chart is reflecting a bearish day, lower red, lower green. It's reflecting a bearish day. So if we get near, and we, as we are above the pivot point, that's great. But again, daily moving average also coincides with the three-period pivot point moving average, which is that gold line. So from a day trader's perspective, on the 60-minute, pops here and gets up to this resistance level, and you get a five-minute sell signal, I'd be inclined to be taking a sell signal near the resistance near 2092. 2092, if you note, and we have area of resistance, 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 the market broke out, took off, came back near that area, acted as support, broke down, it came back and acted as resistance. It broke through it, snapped back to it, and crapped, or crashed out, I mean. So again, that would be a short-term area for sell signals up there. Um, if I'm going to look to be a buyer of this market, it needs to get above, for me, from a day trading perspective, if you'll note also that this is the last conditional change, this is where the market broke down from, you have a small risk up here from a day trade perspective. So I would want to sell the market up in this level. And one of the other things that I would point out to you is that as we recovered Friday, as we recovered Friday off the lows and we had some follow through strength, um, we're not seeing a whole lot of um, market volume, which leads me to another interesting uh, point from a day trading perspective. Unfortunately, I did do this in when I was in Prague, and I showed everyone this. And it was, um, I think they, I, I hope the translators uh, did a nice job. Um, but one of the things that we were pointing out was that we had a the market was starting to see newer highs in the S and P's, and as we were starting to see newer highs, we were not seeing aggressive highs. In fact, we formed a divergence in the on balance volume indicator. So we started to see divergence on that rally um, on, on third, even on Thursday as we got into Friday. Now Friday morning some news happened about China allowing for short selling. That was the main excuse. I think I tweeted that out and it was just a you know five, six o'clock in the morning. It was a free for all all the way down. But the volume before that report release did reflect and so uh, you know that when we come in this room, we do look at the 60-minute trend of the market. I like to look at the 60-minute trend of the OBV to give me a hint if the market's going to continue to the upside. And again, Friday we saw, and Thursday actually, we saw that weakening of that OBV. Now we never know what the severity of a, of, of, of the, uh, of a move is, but for this particular rally back, I can tell you that the market had a nice little rally back, but it's testing resistance areas, it's testing moving averages, and I will be looking for short-term sell signals there. Where else would I be looking for a sell signal? Back underneath the pivot, because the pivot can act as support. And if the market does go, and I understand from 1290 to 1280 is 10 handles, but in the scheme of things, uh, 10 handles is, you know, if you can't get short somehow and the market starts to roll over, remember, 
we get underneath the daily pivot, this thing's got problems. Next, I want to go through the euro currency real quick. Or try to. There we go. Come on, baby. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay, for the euro, um, one of the interesting aspects is I know a week ago I said there's something going on between the dollar index and remember how we talked about this? I said the dollar index and even the treasury bonds are almost pricing in that they're kind of peaking out. Maybe interest rates aren't going down, so maybe they're, you know, it was, it was a situation that we had started to note. If you, it's, it's very subtle, but I hope we can pick these up more often and, and we're in, in the, as we talk in the trading room. But as prices are moving down, note that on that sell-off as we get near the person's pivot, the green level, the euro currency is starting to form bullish convergence. We made, as I can share with you, and I know this is after the fact, but I'm pretty sure we covered this a little bit last week. Um, if we notice that we are starting to form volume the week the the, the sell-off is in weak hands it's not making newer lows in volume and we start to see the market move aggressive so uh, and and this is the definition of aggressive sw uh, pop this is everyone's covering their shorts all at one time kind of well not all their shorts but they're covering their shorts it's it's a bull trap people are bear trap people get short in the hole and they get stopped out and the market doesn't give them any mercy it just just slays them, cuts their head right off. It's kind of like um, any event. I, I won't go there. I was going to say something, but needless to say, the rally, it, you know, it very choppy. And so when you when you start to see pullbacks near support or high close dojis, right, and you have an upswing in volume, you know that 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 just like I was sharing it with the stock. If the volume is very strong and then you get a pullback, it may tell you that if the market continues, it, it may see more aggressive, higher moves. And we have been seeing that. Um, so with that said, for the euro currency, if we, take a, if we get a move, believe it or not, back over this last conditional change in the euro or I get some kind of a, a nice little setup, I'll be looking to be a buyer, believe it or not, in the euro as I think we can try one more time to get back up into testing the 110, 111 level. You do have on a daily chart a potential major double bottom uh, occurring. We are forming just like the S&Ps. It's kind of like the opposite. The S&Ps are coming, coming into daily moving average resistance. The euro is coming into daily moving average support. There's the moving average. There's the support. So it's either, it's got two things. It's bouncing against the daily moving average and it's bouncing, it's supporting against the daily pivot. If this holds, you're going to get a buy signal. We should start to see some upside move. If you take out the level that I just pointed out near that 108 and it starts to move up, this starts to may have the flavor of more like a bull flag formation or consolidation and it could see an aggressive move up, which would shock and probably freak out a lot of people because I don't think there's, I mean, there's still people that say that the euro is going to parity. And while it might, if it, if it pops over 108, it, it's going to go to 110 first. Now, if it fails from where must the market fail from in order for me to say I'm dead wrong? Well, this PPS buy signal also is a last conditional change. And so from a daily perspective, it's going to have to come from a close below that level. And then Katie, bar the doors. This is this has got more, you know, if the first stop is going to be down there 105 and then next to that is God knows parity probably. Okay. So I wanted to go through um, from a day trading perspective, levels to watch. This was recorded. You can also see the fact on a 15 minute, um, the Euro has been doing a very nice job in providing trade signals uh, with the indicators. Um, and we haven't something we haven't really, I know we've taken some, tra I know I've taken trades, I know you guys have too, and we've, we've taken a position and with the FXE and we've kind of traded this bottom successfully and I've kind of ignored it because I've been looking at other trades. But uh, looking at the daily volume and uh, looking at the, even the daily chart patterns and the weekly, but more importantly, which is something, and, and I'm 
telling you that in Europe, a lot of people trade Forex. It's like the number one traded, I mean, they don't even know how to spell options almost. It's, it's really bizarre. I don't mean to insult anyone. I'm just saying they're not interested in options. They haven't been educated yet. They don't trust them. Um, options is just not something that they're into right now. But everyone in, and I mean, even when I was in Paris, I mean, the big thing is Forex. Everyone wants Forex, Forex. Everyone's a Forex, you know, everyone's trading Forex. Um, so with that said, um, in talking to people, they're all looking at one and three minute charts. I go, do you not look at the general trend direction and look at the higher degree time frames? And people's answers is, what for? <clears throat> okay, um, nice. So when I talk to people who are like got one year experience and they've, they've been trading a long time and they go, oh, what for? Um, you know, and I'm, I hope that didn't sound too sarcastic by one year whole, uh, one whole year of experience in trading. And I guess in the last year, if you can survive last year, you know, that says a lot. But the fact that you've got one whole year and you're not willing to look at longer term charts and look at the overall trend, that to me is, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I don't know. I like to, I like to be fully informed. But when I, when I take a look at the uh, weekly charts and I say, okay, so this market is definitely forming some kind of a base in here and we have a volume uptick that supports that basing action. If you get follow through and if you note the on balance volume did cross over a longer term moving average. It has not ever happened before and it has stayed above and has made new higher highs. It's made higher lows and higher highs. Now, the volume has made higher lows and higher highs and price hasn't. So it leads us to, to suspect if volume does precede price, then guess what? We should see higher highs and higher lows and it's almost the very similar pattern that we had back here, whereas the sense that we started to make higher highs and higher lows, and even back in this point in time when everyone said the euro was going to go to zero or there was going to be the north and the south, as you remember, people said, oh, they should cut the euro in the north and the south and, you know, all that stuff. If you notice, we had, as the market had a bottom and made a nice, um, nice run trend, to the upside. It made a nice trend to the upside. So I'm not saying, you know, that we're going to see a nice trend to the upside, but it certainly would not surprise me if if by, you know, the the fall uh, or something happened and people changed their minds to see the market get back, you know, somewhere into this 115, 118 range. But we'll watch this uh, according to the weekly volume and watch those uh, um, longer term uh, levels on a on a on a one higher to one up everything looking at the monthly volume we have departed significantly too far from the volume or from the means and when sometimes we depart too far from the means we get a pause sometimes when we depart too far from the means we get a pause interestingly enough this is the month of april we're coming to the close of april and you'll notice that in the month itself the market is forming a doji. And if you notice that kind of after the similarities, after a long downtrend, after a time period where we see departure of the means of price moving, act, uh, 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 price moving averages, you'll also notice that that's very similar situation. We start to get these like kind of doji-esque type of patterns after, you know, um, time frame uh, moves. And so when you depart too far from the means, both in price as well as the volume, and you get these monthly doji-esque uh, type of patterns, you'll note throughout history, and I'm you know, only going back since 2005 on these you know, significant downturns. On all of these significant downturns, it's a common uh, observation that we're getting these doji-esque turns when we depart too far from the means, from the volume levels, not just the price levels but we tend to get uh, substantial upside surprise sneak attack rallies. Anyway, that concludes today's um, market uh, pre-session wrap-up. We'll keep our eyes on Yelp, and as always, if I see something or it's time to dump something uh, or get into something, it seems to be um, a, a fairly uh, accessible situation for me to tweet out um, certain things. I know that I don't remember to do it all the time, but uh, needless to say, uh, I did uh, 
generate 102 names uh, for daily sell signals and 42 for weekly signals. And what I wanted to tune in for Monday was to go through what does the market look like. And of course, um, I didn't mean to tweet as much stuff, but still bullish on MS going into earnings. And um, any event, I just uh, want you to know that if you haven't signed up for this stuff, um, or it's not really signing up, it's just all you have to do is go to, if you want to receive my tweets, first go review them and see if there's something that you don't mind getting um, you know, alerted to. As you can see, I mean, maybe one, two, I think Friday I got a little uh, uh, zealous because of uh, what was going on in the market, but other than that, I gen generally tend to keep them market uh, uh, those uh, tweets. That's all I have for uh, the morning wrap-up. We are trading here at 92, and at 92 and three quarters is the S&Ps just hit 94. Um, we still do not have, and, and I could be wrong in this one, but if I'm going to be looking for a sell signal as we're near resistance, um, I'm going to be looking for a sell signal at, at this particular resistance level for a day trade. So in the S&Ps, You will note, even on a three-minute, I don't have any, there are no, we're none, not any, and that's what I was mentioning. If we are going to look for it, and we did form on a five-minute basis a doji, but we don't have a low-closed doji, we have nothing on a 15-minute. Um, not sure why that changed my time frame. must be because of a global. So looking at the 60 daily, weekly, that trapping. This, you know, if this was a, a on a weekly chart, you know, if, if the volume looked a little bit better, I'd be more excited about buying this market any old place in the S&Ps. But the fact is that the volume has been one sneaky little uh, situation. And um, but in any event, we are in, you know we're in the, the we are in this little trading range here, and so um, I don't mind looking at sell signals up against the resistance, and the resistance is the three period pivot point moving average and the daily MAs. So right now, I just don't have a sell signal to uh, that has generated on a, a, any of the um, intraday time patterns that uh, three or five minute. That concludes our planning and scanning. I know we went a little way over, but uh, hopefully um, we had a lot of information to cover and some good techniques to follow for your trades for the rest of the week. Thank you all very much.